Today, we're really happy to have Maddie Sarvinsky. Um, she is the founder and director of a campaign for a green nuclear deal. She recently wrote a piece um, that we're going to talk about today for the Daily Herald called Fossil Fuel Workers Will Win Big If Illinois Can't Pass an Energy Bill, Including Nuclear Power This Year. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, of course. Um, so how about we start, you know, just talk about what's been going on with the Byron nuclear uh, power plant in, in Illinois. What is the situation currently? Sure. So basically, um, the nuclear plants, or at least four of the ones that we're talking about in Illinois, exist in an electricity market. And the issue with that is these nuclear plants are being forced off the grid by subsidized renewable energy projects and historically cheap natural gas. So last August, Exelon, the operating utility for the Byron and Dresden nuclear plants, announced that they were going to have to shut down two of these plants this year in September and November of 2021, unless something was done or legislation was passed to adequately value nuclear for its reliable carbon-free electricity. And since August, there has been a campaign to pass a comprehensive um, energy package to take Illinois into a carbon-free future. And the initial thought was that May 31st would be a deadline for legislative action, being the end of the spring legislative session. But as you were describing earlier, there's been you know, major disagreement by the environmental lobby and the labor lobby and that deadline sort of came and went. Um, negotiations continued with the thought being that, okay, we can bring legislators back to Springfield for the summer to vote on this ahead of the closure of Byron and then Dresden. And unfortunately, yesterday it was announced by both sides that they've reached an impasse and will be um, foregoing conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, these plants are in great condition and can and should continue to operate for decades to come. But unless action is taken, you know, in the next week or two, there will be no option to reverse course and they'll have to permanently shut down. Mm -hmm. And if this plant closes, how will that affect the state's ability to meet its greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions goal? I mean, it will be extremely difficult to come back from. I dare say it may even result in a permanent emission spike. You know, over the course of the past year, um, Governor Pritzker has overseen the largest increase in electricity emissions in the nation, um, which are up 31%. So if we lose 30% of our state's carbon-free electricity, I mean, that's just simply going to entrench fossil fuels and make it that much tougher to get to his goal of carbon free by 2050. Hmm. And kind of at the center of a lot of this um, is some legislation that I know you and others are rallying behind called the Climate Union Jobs Act. Can you talk about that legislation and why you're so supportive of it? Yeah. So this is the labor led bill. And there are a lot of things that personally I love about it, including, you know, uh, mandates for electric school buses, a lot of really awesome incentivization programs, um, guarantees for fossil fuel workers who are displaced with the transition. But the main reason that I and others in my organization are backing this is because it prioritizes protecting Byron and Dresden. Um, and, and that's simply the most important thing to keeping emissions down in Illinois, to saving thousands of jobs in clean energy and to reaching those admirable climate targets. So there are a lot of things to like about it and I'm particularly thrilled to be supporting the bill labors behind, but really for me, it's that nuclear component. And as you pointed out, unfortunately, it seems like negotiations have pretty much broken down. What have been the main points of disagreements between environmentalist groups and labor unions? Sure. There are, there are two sticking points as far as we can tell from the outside. So the first is the fate of a handful of fossil fuel plants. 
on the one side, environmentalists want a legal closure deadline for all coal plants and all natural gas plants in the states, no exceptions. On the other side, labor would like exceptions. Um, there are three relatively new and under construction fossil fuel plants that they would like to be exempt from that provision, mostly to you know, protect those jobs in construction and operation, as well as protect the energy co-ops and municipalities that have invested in them. So what you get now is this dangerous game of chicken, as I mentioned in my article, where in order to solidify all coal closures and all natural gas closures, environmentalists are willing to risk this massive and perhaps permanent spike in emissions for failure to save Byron and Dresden with legislation. So that's the, that's the one issue. The second issue is what you mentioned before, which are the fair labor provisions. Labor has been working hard to ensure that renewable energy projects in the state going forward would hire union employees as well as pay a prevailing wage. And um, as you were discussing before, the environmental NGOs are pushing back, um, claiming that this would disproportionately hurt minority communities and people of color. And so that seems to be our other sticking point. And, you know, recently I did a segment on the show about nuclear power. It got a lot of very passionate uh, comments on both sides, which I think is good. Like I think, as I said in that video, I've personally, my views have been involving on nuclear. I'm definitely not any type of scientist, but um, you know, my views are changing. I think it's a good discussion, but I mean, it seems to me there are very valid concerns about nuclear energy. I think mostly, you know, danger of meltdowns and the issue of storage. So, you know, what would be your response to some of these concerns from those on the left about nuclear energy? Luckily, there's a lot of great information um, out there on these issues, people who work has inspired me. I think actually Lee Phillips just published a really great piece called Nuclear Energy in the Land that deals with some of these safety issues as well as um, concerns over the waste. But what I will say is that um, nuclear is any clean energy transition, any energy source that we look at has to be reliable, resilient, cost-effective, carbon-free, and safe. And nuclear is the only energy source that we have that checks all of those boxes. It's actually the safest way to reliably produce electricity. Um, and in terms of the waste, I think there's a lot of misinformation about it, particularly coming from The Simpsons. At least that's how I first learned about nuclear waste, but it's actually really boring. It just sits on site, um, has never hurt anyone. But what I will say about The Simpsons quickly is that there's a lot of misinformation about nuclear in it, but it does deliver one really powerful truth about nuclear. It shows this incredible reality where a person without a college degree can support his or her spouse and three children um, have a home in a beautiful community and contribute to a better world through a union backed clean energy job. And that reality ends for a lot of folks in Illinois if we lose these plants in the coming months. I gotta say, I've never looked at the Simpsons like that, but that's a great way to put it. <laughs> if you ignore the three eyed fish, it's very pro nuclear actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and so can you tell us about, you know, the organization campaign for a green nuclear deal? What are some of the things you've been up to lately? What, what are you generally trying to do as an organization? Sure. So our general mission is to um, share a vision for made in America nuclear power as a way to regain industrial capabilities and create high wage, strong, permanent, clean energy jobs and um, or jobs in clean energy and manufacturing. So my hope with this organization was to sort of punch at the national level and get into the national conversation. 
um, particularly talking about expanding public power through federal vehicles, et cetera. But there is no future for nuclear in the United States if they're losing perfectly good plants. I mean, Illinois is America's nuclear powerhouse. So this year I've been primarily working in New York to show what happens when you shut down perfectly good plants like Indian Point and then fighting like hell to keep Byron and Dresden living to see another day. And this might be my final question, but just broadly about the Green New Deal. And, you know, it's kind of easy to forget that the Green New Deal, at least as a slogan, is like actually relatively new. And, you know, I, I have such complicated feelings about it. I feel like in certain local areas and cases, there's a lot of really great, inspiring work. You know, we we had on our show fairly recently, a few months ago, um, someone from New York, um, Climate Jobs, and they've been doing a lot of great work getting buy-in from the building trades and around green jobs, um, you know, but as we've talked about on the show, there's, I have a lot of criticisms of the approach as well. I mean, what is your kind of broad assessment of like the Green New Deal generally? What do you think is the biggest mistake the left is making around this? What do we need to do better in order to make this a reality? I would say there are two main criticisms that I have. And first is that I don't think there is any such thing as a serious decarbonization an environmental jobs program that doesn't absolutely recognize and prioritize nuclear power. And I recognize that the left is changing its mind. And I think we've made a lot of powerful progress, but I think more people need to be speaking up on this issue. And then the second is it's not a jobs program of any sort if it doesn't have the backing of labor. I think um, a lot of the sort of local organizations organizing around the Green New Deal haven't, aren't really concerned about what their local unions want, don't have the backing of trades workers, and have sort of left them out of the conversation. So that's something that I'm hoping to at least fix is being actively involved and honestly just amplifying the message of what working class people actually want and how we can sort of accommodate that in a transition to a low carbon future. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe. You can also watch the full episode and catch our future live streams by clicking the join button below and becoming a Jacobin YouTube member. Thanks.